Hi there. I am inside of a Jupyter Notebook and I have a little bit of code over here that generates a plot that I'm gonna scroll down to now. And in the plot, you can see two things. You can see an orange line that represents a true distribution that I'm going to sample data out of. So that means I will sample a couple of data points there, maybe a little bit more data points over here because this hill is bigger than over there. But that's gonna give me a sample and then what I've done is I've drawn this histogram over here from that sample. So again, orange line determines how data is generated. I have a small sample of 200 data points and then this histogram that is showing me where the data sort of lands. And you could look at this and you could kind of go, gee, that histogram that you have over there, that actually looks like a pretty okay way to describe this orange distribution. That's what histograms are good for. They're good at describing where masses of data might lie. And although for visualization purposes, you could argue that that's actually enough, you could wonder if this would also hold for algorithmic purposes. After all, this is a bit of a toy example in the greater scheme of things, but you can imagine that we wanna have algorithms that can estimate a distribution on our behalf. If we can have some training data and try to get an algorithm to as closely as possible estimate this orange line, then that can be useful for downstream tasks. If we know which regions are unlikely, then we can do things like outlier detection. And this has all sorts of interesting use cases in fraud analysis. But the main question, at least for now, is that if we are talking about this histogram, would that be sufficient for algorithmic purposes? And what I wanna do first is explain that it might not be the greatest idea, and then also give you an alternative. So what's not to like about this histogram? Well, it does come with a bit of a hyperparameter. You see, the way histograms work is they take the input space, so to say, and they cut it up into bins. You can definitely see that there are equidistant bins over here where data is put into. And you can also see that these bins, although a lot of them are filled up properly, they're not necessarily perfect. There are a couple of gaps over here, and there are also a couple of places where it just kind of overshoots. And part of that is related to the fact that there's a hyperparameter, which is how many bins do we want to go ahead and use? In the code right now, I'm using 20 bins, but let's say I put it to 10 instead. Then this is what the distribution looks like. And again, we can see a couple of places where it undershoots and where it overshoots. And some of these things do get remedied if we have more data available to us, but there's also a curse of dimensionality. If we have multiple dimensions, we won't have that much data per dimension to really work with. Right off the bat, I hope that we agree that doing this histogram thing, because it's so bucketed, we are really limiting ourselves a little bit because we are very much dependent on the number of bins that this histogram picks. So instead of using histograms, what I would like to propose instead is that we zoom on a bit of a kernel trick instead. Instead of cutting up our data space into equidistant buckets, we might also be able to calculate something clever by just looking at each individual data point and doing a bit of an approximate distribution around that instead. So here's the mental picture. This is a number line and I'm going to pretend that data points are going to drop on it one by one. Let's suppose that the first data point falls over here then what I could do is I could just draw a small box around it. The box is centered at where the point is, but this is just a bit of density that I'm associating with this one point. Maybe there's another point over here, and again, I'm going to uh, draw this box on top of it. But let's now say that I've got a point that falls over here. Then technically I would like to draw another box around it like so, but you'll notice that there's a bit of overlap over here. The way that I'm going to deal with that is I'm still going to draw the box of the same shape, but I am going to draw the box that overlaps on top of the box that I had before. It's kind of like dropping sand from above. If there's sand below it, I'm just gonna stack the sand on top of it. The benefit of this, of course, is that this is pretty general. As more points come in, I can keep on stacking boxes. And this will eventually also mimic a distribution. And I can do this without using any sort of notion of bins that have to be known up front. And what's more, 
I also have a bit of wiggle room in terms of the shape of the box that I'm dropping down below here. For example, one thing I could also do is draw another point, but instead of drawing a box that lies on top, I can just come up with, let's say, a normal distribution kind of a shape. Again, the same argument would apply. This little hill would appear every time that there's a new data point. But now you can imagine that when the hills would overlap, so to say, the overlap would just be a little bit more smooth. I've just shown you two shapes, but you can imagine many more. But to be a bit formal, the shape that we draw around the dot, that can be seen as a kernel. We have different kernels that all are associated with different shapes. And inside of Scikit-Learn, if you are interested in doing density estimation, then one method you could use for that is the kernel density estimator. And this estimator works by allowing you to pick a kernel that will then sort of make this histogram, but more smooth. This approximation of a distribution, but again, it is going to be using not histograms, but these kernels. And here's a little bit of code to highlight the options that are available to you. I'm using the kernel density estimator over here. And you can see that I'm passing it a kernel. And that's one of the names that I have in the list over here. There's a cosine kernel, a linear one, a top hat, a Gaussian, there's a whole bunch. And the shape of the kernel can be seen below over here. So we have the top hat kernel, which is literally this orange line. That's the box I alluded to earlier. But you can also see this blue line. That's this Gaussian line over here. There are lots of options to pick from. In general, one way to think about these options is that some options tend to have a thicker tail, which could mean that you're going to have a more smooth curve that you'll be fitting. And others are just a little bit more spiky, which will also have an effect uh, when you're trying to estimate the density. Note, by the way, that the way that I'm plotting this is to actually use the kernel density estimator directly. I have my kernel density estimator over here. Then I'm telling the estimator to fit to a single data point, which is this data point zero. And then I'm going to use the learned density estimator to score all sorts of numbers on the number line, going from minus four to four up until 200. So hopefully this paints a really clear picture of how each and every one of these kernels is really just a new shape that we have around the original data point that we're trying to guesstimate a distribution of. There's one extra thing that I think is good to show as well, which is that we do have access to this bandwidth uh, parameter as well, which allows us to make this distribution just a little bit more thick. We have a bandwidth of one right now. Let's say that I change that to two. Then you can see that the effect is that we really are dealing with uh, more wide distributions over here. That is also a hyperparameter that you could in the end play with if you wanted to. So what is the effect of all this? Well, it's a little bit hard to see because I am drawing lots of lines over here, but just to add a little bit of a highlight, I have the original true distribution over here. That's this pink line that I'm just gonna draw black. You can also see the histogram that's uh, in gray in the background over here. And then you can also see that if I pass the data points that were generated to the kernel density estimator, that there are then lots of different estimates for different distributions. And one thing that I do think is good to observe is that we have two distributions over here that have very thick tails, you could say. That would be this blue line for the Gaussian kernel and this red one for the exponential one. And you can see that those two kernels, because they're so thick, it's not a big surprise to also see them have a little bit more weight to areas where there's just a little bit less data. The blue line and the red line over here they underfit where there's a lot of density and they overfit where there's just a little bit more density. But depending on the use case, this might also just be what you want. Another thing you can clearly see is that this top hat, the square shape that we've got over here, that of course is very edgy. There's a very clear edge where it jumps up and then moves forward. And you can also see that return in the orange line. It's a bit spiky at places. And that's simply because of the effect that we are really jumping around with the kernel over here. Most of all, though, what I really do hope is that we appreciate the fact that there are lots of kernels to pick from, and if you're interested in estimating a distribution, 
then maybe using this technique is preferable to using a histogram. You are no longer dealing with these hard cutoff points in the bins, and that is really going to give you a smooth curve that you can use for downstream tasks. And to maybe give you just a little bit of inspiration of what I think might be a good downstream task, let's say that I've got some sort of data set pair x, y. This is your typical machine learning scenario. Then let's say we're going to train two systems from this. The first system is just going to be our normal machine learning model, but the second system will be the kernel density estimator. We are going to learn from the data set X that we've got. And once it's trained, we can actually score some samples, give us some sort of a likelihood score, so to say. Well then, what can we do in production? Well, if some sort of new data point comes in, then we can reuse this trained kernel density algorithm as a method to do outlier detection. The thinking here is that if we have a score that is too low, we can say that this is probably an outlier. It's just not likely enough. The cool thing about this is that we can say, hey, do not automate anything here. If we're dealing with a data point that's pretty unlike anything that this machine learning algorithm has seen, or something that's at the very edges of what the machine learning algorithm can handle, then that will be an excellent point in time to maybe not automate something on the machine learning's behalf. We can come up with a system where only if we have some sort of an indication that it's something that the machine learning model is comfortable with, then and only then are we going to be passing the data point to the machine learning model. And here we might be able to call predict like we would normally. This is just one application of a kernel density estimator, but I hope you recognize that there are many. And the reason that there are so many is that usually a machine learning system in the end doesn't consist of a single pipeline. There's usually all sorts of stuff around it in order to make it work. And an outlier detection as a step before giving it to an algorithm, that's a sensible idea in practice. And a kernel density estimator can totally help you out with that.